Excuse me, do you mind if I talk to you while you work a little bit? Oh, not at all, man. What's your name? Ricky. Ricky Matos. Are you volunteering here for the day? or? Uh, this is probably my fifth day here, actually. Why are you volunteering? Soy Boricua. I mean, there's nothing else to say, man. This is Change Over Time, a podcast where I think historically about things I geek. I'm Daniel Horowitz Garcia, the alternative historian. Today I'm geeking disasters, focusing on one disaster in particular. Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico on September 20th as a Category 4 storm with winds gusting to more than 110 miles per hour. That's not the most powerful hurricane to hit the island, but it's definitely up there. Puerto Rico had been hit by Hurricane Irma just two weeks prior. Maria came along to finish the job. Almost a month after the storm, most of the island is without power, and only about half the population has access to water. I lost touch with my family for almost two weeks, and I spent that time on social media. I started with a restaurant. Buen Provecho is a restaurant in Cobb County. That's about 20 miles northwest of Atlanta City Center. Before we talk about the restaurant, let's talk about the name. Buen Provecho is a Spanish phrase, sort of equivalent to Bon Appetit. It kind of means enjoy your meal, but it also means more than that. Strangers will say it to you when they walk by your table, because if they don't, it's considered rude. Although there's really no English equivalent, think of it as someone saying, I hope you have a great time eating that. Buen Provecho, the Puerto Rican restaurant, is in a strip mall next to a barber and a vape shop. The second I entered the parking lot, the smell of pork, rice, and beans hit me. Those smells are intimately familiar to me. They're the smells of home. I dropped off some donations and talked with Ricky Matos, who was stacking boxes, getting them ready for the truck. Ricky had a connection to the restaurant, and when I met him, he had already been volunteering for the last five days. Yeah, I actually know Elmer, the owner, uh, previously uh, being in the industry myself. I mean, it gets bigger every day that I come here. Um, And the movement and, you know, el tráfico, you can see just a lot of people coming and going. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's great. I think it's good locally. It's still hard to see, what, you know, the images that I see and the back and forth on, on, on the Internet as far as what's going on down there, obviously. So, But it's so great to see this. On the day I arrived, Ricky was one of about 15 people volunteering their time to process donations. But he was the only person I spoke to who had been to Buen Provecho before. Everyone else saw a post on Facebook. Jocelyn Capri was one of those people who first learned of the restaurant through social media, and she organized a team of folks to come and help out for the day. Well, I live in uh, Forsyth County, and I started my own collection and with my community, my school that I work at, and my family and friends, and we just gathered together, we loaded a truck, and we brought it here today, and we said, we're here to help you the entire day. Put us to work. So that's what they've been doing. To put this in some perspective, Forsyth County is more than 35 miles from Buen Puerto In Atlanta terms, that can be more than an hour's drive, one way. That's not a trip this city takes lightly. But people in the U.S. respond to disasters with speed and generosity. Donations were being dropped off every few minutes. And I have to say, it looked to me like as many non-Puerto Ricans as folks from the island were bringing in needed supplies. Inside the restaurant, most of the volunteers were Puerto Ricans with family on the island. The kitchen was cooking and staff was serving lunch at a rapid pace, answering phones and cleaning as more than a dozen people put supplies in boxes, then taped and labeled those boxes for the truck. Personally, it doesn't surprise me that a restaurant is the site of community activity. It didn't surprise Jocelyn either. You go to any Puerto Rican family's house and the first thing that they do is serving food. It's always at the table. And this is the table here at Buen Provecho. Buen Provecho began as a catering business in 2007 launched by Elmer Pasapera. In 2011, he bought a food truck. And then that's when it really took off, no pun intended. You know, that's when people started to get to know about Juan Provecho. I had it for four years. I retired it end of 2014, beginning of 2015, and opened up the restaurant in April 2015. That food truck was hard to track down. Believe me when I tell you I tried. The restaurant is an easier place to find. But Elmer wasn't just looking to sell food to Puerto Ricans. That's a good business move. Today, there are less than 100,000 Puerto Ricans throughout the entire state of Georgia, and that represents a gigantic growth in the last 10 years. It made sense for Elmer to introduce the food to as many people as he could. Today, the restaurant also serves as a place for people with a connection to the island to find the comfort foods we grew up with. 
In the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, it's become a chance to do something in the face of a tragedy. I got to be honest with you. I, you know, when I did this in social media, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, I, I didn't expect the massive response, to be honest. I said, you know, I need to do something, even if it's just me and my employees here at the restaurant. We have to do something for our people, you know. In all honesty, the response has been incredible, incredible. And, and the great thing about it is, you know, a lot of people are thanking me, but in reality, I'm just a voice. I'm just here to, you know, provide a place where people can come and, uh, and participate, you know, in the sense of bringing donations and showing their support, you know, and the love for, for our people back home. Elmer is working with local businesses, including another restaurant called Porch Light Latin Kitchen to gather donations, put them on a cargo plane, and deliver them to the island's government where they can be distributed to those in need. Some of those in need are family members of the volunteers. Many of those I talked to at the restaurant that day still hadn't heard from their family. Many others had yet to talk directly to any loved ones and were only getting word secondhand through Facebook. Elmer was lucky enough to talk with someone, but the news he got was rough. I was able to get in contact with my cousin in, in Bayamon and, you know, we spoke and she was crying, talking to me and said, Elmer, however you remember home, doesn't exist anymore. And <laughs> it puts me on an emotional roller coaster because, you know, when the opportunity comes that I'm able to go and travel, just to think that those things are not there, it's heartbreaking. As I awkwardly walked around asking people for interviews, the volunteers never stopped working. Donations kept coming in and the truck, filled with boxes, made the delivery to the warehouse. It came back and they started the whole process again. Even still, the stack of bottled water alone was more than five feet high when I left at the end of the day. People talked about home and food and family throughout the entire process. So what do we make of all this? What happens now? What should we expect? How does this hurricane fit into other disasters? I'll historicize after the break. Oral history is learning about the past by engaging with people who lived it. It's about critically examining memory and narrative. You don't have to be a historian or a folklorist or an anthropologist to listen to great oral history. Amplify is an oral history podcast network bringing podcasting to the field of oral history. The network is working to spread the word on great oral history projects. Podcasts like Press Record, The Other Side of the Mic, and The Wisdom Project are members. So is Change Over Time. Head on over to AmplifyVoices.org to find out more. Now let's get back to the show. Disaster isn't new. Puerto Rico has been hit by other hurricanes. Floods, fires, and famine have ravaged humanity all over the world. Studying disasters, however, is relatively new. Disaster studies as a field only began in the 1960s. It's interdisciplinary, although it does lean heavily into the technological and social sciences. I talked with Dr. Jacob Remus, a disaster scholar who focuses more on the sociological aspects of disasters than the technical. Remus is the author of Disaster Citizenship, as well as a historian at New York University. I wanted a way to make sense of what I was seeing, hearing, and feeling. Of course, I found a historian. Remus was a great person to talk with, much more optimistic than I am. His start in the field began with Katrina. It was my third semester of graduate school, and I was in a class about uh, North American urban history. And uh, the professor in the class, Sally Deutsch, was presenting what we were going to read that semester, because it was the very beginning of the semester. And one of the books was a really great book by Carl Smith called uh, Urban Disorder and the Shape of Belief. And it's all about um, how people in the late 19th century thought about disorder and order in, in cities. And, and a third of it is about um, the Chicago Fire, but anyway, so Smith uh, has all these stories about both stories of looting and about vigilantism after the fire were really widespread and how they turned out not to be true and they were really just about people's anxiety living in the city. And so Sally says to us during this week, introducing this book, watch all of these stories that we are hearing from, Katri- from New Orleans about animalism, about the rapes and the murders and the looting and the whatnot – that's all going to turn out not to be true. And sure enough, a week, a month, two months later, they turn out to be grossly exaggerated. They weren't really true. Uh, people were not shooting at rescue helicopters. There was not sort of this mass Hobbesian animalism as soon as the state disappeared. And so 
that was something that really interested me. Um, yeah, so really, I am one of a generation of disaster scholars where uh, who is brought into the field by Katrina, um, and then have sort of spent my career watching one disaster after another. What is a disaster anyway? It seems obvious, and I think that's because it is obvious, especially when Dr. Remus explains it. I think I think it first developed in the seventies. There's no such thing as a natural disaster. And that what we, um, the language we use is that there's a hazard. And hazards are sometimes natural, right? They can be a hurricane, they can be a wildfire, they can be a tornado. Um, or they can be not natural, right? Um, they can be an industrial fire, or they could be a nuclear bomb falling from the sky, right? Like both, both, ha- both natural and unnatural hazards. And then what, what turns that hazard into a disaster is its intersection with society. Um, so one way of thinking about that is if a hurricane goes over an uninhabited island or if there's an earthquake on an uninhabited mountain, it's not a disaster. It's just a thing that happens. And it's only a disaster if there are people involved and if there's society involved. Um, so depending on sort of which scholar you're reading, you can think about it in terms of vulnerability. So people are vulnerable to disasters and vulnerability is socially constructed. Other scholars would put it as a political economy of risk, right? So risk is distributed based on our political economy of sort of who gets what. That's that's different ways of saying the same thing. The first first line on my syllabus is, there's no such thing as a natural disaster. Socially constructed things are real. Think about money. Money is real. But without society backing it up, those numbers at the ATM don't mean much. A disaster is socially constructed. What that means is something or some things are backing up that construction. Part of what makes a disaster is that normal institutions are stretched beyond their capacity. The state is stretched beyond its capacity. Hospitals are stretched beyond their capacity. And in some ways, if they're not stretched beyond their capacity, they're not really a disaster. Or they're not stretched beyond their ordinary capacity. It's not really a disaster. It's just an everyday time when people come to that, when like some people are injured and go to the hospital. It's only when things are really big and and there's you have to do something extra that we think of it as a, as a disaster. What should we look for in the aftermath of something like Hurricane Maria? Poverty is one thing. Of course poverty existed in Puerto Rico before the storm, but something different happens when someone is made poor because of a disaster. They become the deserving poor. They have nothing, but it's not their fault. Still, there is a limit to what even the deserving poor can receive. In Halifax in 1917, a munition ship exploded in the harbor during World War I. Um, About 2,000 people died. 25,000 people were made homeless or jobless. And there was a lot of fundraising in Massachusetts for a variety of reasons. And they end up raising essentially $700,000. And that money ends up going to buy people new furniture. The idea is people should be restored to the level where they were before the disaster. So rich people who had their furniture destroyed got nice new furniture. Poor people who got their furniture destroyed got crappy used furniture. And so it was this this kind of bizarre way in which class was replicated in the disaster relief project when you could imagine a more equitable system of everyone gets the same furniture, right? The aftermath of a disaster may be a time when people come together, but it is also a time of conflict. Disasters are political. They are politically created, and the response is deeply politicized. Dr. Remus put it in military terms, although a bit reluctantly. I see relief more as a, as a terrain of battle. That, that's kind of more of a, that's a more martial uh, metaphor than I really like. But like, I think relief is a place in which recipients and the state contest over, over that power. And it can certainly be a time in which the state wins that contestation and reclaims that power, but it doesn't have to be. And I think that there are, there are times we can see both at a big scale, but also at individual scales of times when recipients get what they want and don't give up the the power and autonomy in their lives. 
or they do what poor people do all the time, which is kind of make compromises here and bounce back and forth and ask for aid from the government here, but then the government's demands become too onerous, then they go to sort of their friends and families and try to get support there, and then the friends and families' support becomes too onerous and they go back to the states and sort of go back and forth and try to piece together the support they can get, which I guess we can see as the state winning, uh, but it's also about people trying to get some, like, retain some agency in their lives. But, but it's also, I think, about recognizing that disasters, like so many things, it's not, there's not an engineering solution. Disasters are political events with political causes and political solutions. And yes, engineering and technical things come into that. But the question is really, how do we distribute our resources, which is a political question. It's not just trying to solve disasters by building better and higher is, is missing the point because you're just shifting vulnerability somewhere else. Remus sees hope in disasters. That's a weird thing to say, but hear me out. A disaster makes the relationship between the state and the people plain for everyone to see. The values in society are laid bare. Who gets what when shows who's valued. It also makes plain the relationships we need in order to survive. There has to be organizing, right? What worries me about the nonprofit industrial complex is its reliance on donors. It's reliance on funding from people outside. Outside. So it's still a relationship of charity, right? And what I think is really important are relationships of solidarity, which are built through sociality, right? They're, they're built through having meals together and then through organizations and through institutions. So I, I guess I'm, I'm not against organizations and institutions, but I do think that like having them be among equals is important. I think one of the things that's, that's really interesting about the Atlanta restaurant is that it was, it was imagined as Puerto Ricans helping other Puerto Ricans, right? It was a story about social equals trying to help each other as opposed to the relation as opposed to like the relationship of like Americans helping Haiti right as like the poor cousin I mean obviously there are class divisions within Puerto Rico and but I think that like from that sort of instinctual sense of solidarity from getting to know each other in new ways I it's not it won't necessarily happen but what could happen is building both sort of habits but also building institutions that encourage people to help each other rather than to compete with each other Does that makes sense it makes a lot of sense to me and i'll tell you why i need to go back to before european contact though the taino people were the indigenous people of puerto rico much of the caribbean in fact we use Taino words all the time. Barbecue, canoe, and hurricane are all Taino words. There is Taino mythology about storms. It goes like this. Wabana, also known as the Cacique of the Winds, was the top storm goddess. There are many versions of what she was like, but the one that makes sense to me is the one I grew up with. It says she was a goddess quick to anger. She would become particularly angry when promises were unfulfilled and when lies and deceit were common among the people. Wabanao would send a storm, a hurricane, to erase the lies and reveal the truth. It isn't uncommon for a people to create a mythology that ties natural phenomenon to societal behavior, as Dr. Remus explains. I think there's a, there, it makes a lot of sense in kind of an anthropological sense that cultures in which there are these recurrent disasters or exp explain them both both theologically and sociologically right like explain that the theology around these disasters are recognize that there is something going on with society right recognize that like they are calls to action about making society better i'm kind of stretching here but like maybe one of the things that happens in kind of modernity when we lose that way of thinking about the world is that we is that things become naturalized and because we come we have these natural explanations for these meteorological explanations for hurricanes these seismological explanations for earthquakes that we lose the practice of thinking about them sociologically and politically i don't think that taino people had a phrase for socially constructed but the existence of the mythology seems evidence to me that Tainos knew their world included storms as part of the politics of the day. They may have used myth to make sense of reality after a disaster. Perhaps the truth has been revealed because of these storms. 
perhaps we have a chance to move forward and create something new, something better. It's easy to be paralyzed in the face of something this overwhelming, especially when it hits so close to home, when all I want to do is talk to my mom and make sure my brother is okay, that my nieces are fine, my cousins, my uncles, and my in-laws are okay. I wanted to know if I was alone in thinking all this. Uh, it was great talking with Jacob. He helped me feel a lot better after a conversation. But it was the interview with Elmer that made me think I'm not alone in all of this. You know, my family's living it. Uh, the people Puerto Rico are living it. And they have, to, they, they have to come back from this. You know, they have to build agriculturally, structurally, emotionally, physically. You know, the island is hurting. Uh, the people are hurting. But, you know, one thing I will say about, about the Puerto Rican people is that we're fighters, we're warriors, and we're going to overcome. This is, you know, this is a setback, but it's for the comeback. And uh, we're going to come back, and we're going to come back stronger. Communities in Puerto Rico need your help. The Hurricane Maria Community Relief Fund supports grassroots organizations working with vulnerable populations across the island. You can make your donation at mariafund.org. Anything you give is much appreciated. You can find more information about this podcast at alternativehistorian.com. I also tweet at Daniel Altist. Take a moment to rate this on iTunes. It helps people find the podcast. Safe travels. Safe travels.